Producer and engineer Nicholas Vans has worked with the likes of Deer Hunter, The War on Drugs, Fisher Spooner and Animal Collective. We sat down with him in his Brooklyn studio, Rare Book Room, and began by asking him how his approach to production has changed over his career. It's been an evolving role. Uh, I think when I started, I primarily worked with bands that I thought sounded very good when I saw them live, and my job would have been at that point to capture that moment. And I think over the course of just doing that a lot, people came to me with more or less prepared projects where it was useful to make the record better if we sat down and maybe worked out some things that hadn't been worked out yet. And some people don't like to be called producers because they believe it's just really a technical craft of engineering a record, and it kind of is. Um, production is more like opening the song up really like a lot and just making sure everything's okay and then putting it back together. And sometimes you end up at exactly the place where you started, but at least you've considered everything. Like many music pros, Nicholas acts as both producer and engineer on some projects. We asked whether there's ever any internal conflict between the two roles. No, it's usually, you know, if somebody's doing a take and you know it could be better, there's no, you're, the role is to, actually the role, neither engineer nor producer, you're just there to help the record get made. If that means getting somebody a glass of water or telling them that, you know, <clears throat> the take five minutes ago had something very special, could we listen to it and see maybe if they can discern what was so special about it so that the next take can have some of that influence it, then you do that. I think you're just there to help, so uh, whatever is needed. It's also because it's not something where there's 40 people working on a project, like in a film, I think, or hundreds. Um, it's kind of important to have a predefined task. Uh, I think on a record, it's a little more open-ended. Mostly if you're capable of doing a lot of things, then you kind of do whatever that thing is that's needed mm -hmm. for the record, because that's the most important thing, is that that vision gets made, and you're there to help do that, mm -hmm. or I'm there to help do that. Although the recording space at Rare Book Room is set up to track a live band, many of Nicholas's tracks have a much bigger sound than that. How does he get across that sense of depth, width, and energy? Um, I made a record by uh, Black Dice around 2003, 2004, I think, which was exactly that problem. I'd seen them live many times, and they're loud and very, very... Um, the textures are really, really wild and powerful. And when you record and play back out of speakers, it just sort of falls flat. So you have to overcompensate in certain ways because in the end, it's going to come out of either little earbuds or somebody's laptop. And somehow, if the music is kind of aggressive, then you want it to really give a lot of energy so that the speakers are kind of trembling, even at low volume. And the way you do that is kind of stack frequencies, of course. But uh, the other way is to literally be aware of it as you do it. You have to think about the fact that in the end it's going to have issues and you need to compensate for those earlier on. That might mean having a warmer sound than you need. For example, you might use a ribbon mic to get an amplifier to feel a little darker. So then when you push it, it's not just the high frequencies that you hear really loudly, but more of the mid-range. In this room in particular, the actual room itself is the best indicator of the energy that's uh, happening. So you have to be able to capture that as well. And that could mean a couple of remikes, or it could mean <clears throat> using compression creatively on maybe not the main guitar mic, but maybe a secondary one, so that when the guitar stops, you feel the room come back. And that gives you a sense of space without using digital reverb or anything like that. You just naturally let the room do its thing. Bleed helps a lot. A lot of people want to record things isolated because you have so much control, and that's really good. What you lose with that is that the bass amp bleeding through the kick drum mic adds a distance first. It's further away from the source. So there's a few milliseconds of lag, and that starts to create a shadow on the sound. And that's the sense of space people have when they listen to a record. If it's too clinical, which can be fun, actually. And on the Daughter record, we used that a lot. We'd go from very, very wide, very, very cinematic, and then a section would come in, like no reverb, as close to the microphone as possible, kind of sing not very loudly, cranked. So all of a sudden, it's claustrophobic. You're like, oh my god, she's right there. Often, 
it's just sitting in front of the speakers and moving things around until something happens. Uh, for example, for a snare drum, if you have a top and bottom mic, they don't have to be dead center. So the kind of bright metallic short sound could be a little bit to the right and the kind of more dense wooden sound can be a little to the left. And if they obviously are hitting at the same time, the impression is center, but sonically it's hitting different parts of your ears at different times. Nicholas has worked hard to get an acoustic in the live room that he's happy with, but how did he do it? And when I first put the room together, um, because there's a concrete floor and brick walls, uh, it was really reverberant. Uh, it sounded great on an acoustic guitar by itself. That's it. Everything else sounded horrible. So I started bringing stuff in. Couch, chairs, a big rug, a second big rug, start hanging things on the walls. And over the course of months, you kind of dial it in. And all of a sudden, it sounds better. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a room that's already treated by a professional, that's incredible because they've thought of all these, these things. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that luxury, so I just kind of like did it organically with things like objects, like you would in a house, for example. It's, it should be as intuitive as possible. And if you think there's something wrong with it and you hear it, you're like, just move something. See if you're right or wrong, confirm it. It's not, you know, you can do it even when you're doing stuff for yourself. Put a couple mics up, play the drums, be like, oh, can I record a drum kit with two mics? You're like, well, not if I'm playing like this. Well, what do I have to do? I have to play lighter over here maybe a little heavier on the kick. And then when somebody comes in, then you get to share that information with them. Okay, so, so I've done that a lot. I've used like maybe two or three mics on the drum kit because it gives it a perspective. I think having 20 mics is useful sometimes. The perspective's sort of a little generic. If you have it a bit wrong, but it sounds good, that's good. You have to work after you're done. You're like, it's already mixed. So how does Nicholas work to put his artists at ease and what are his tricks for coaxing the best performance out of a vocalist? Either I'm very lucky or uh, I have decent people skills. People tend to be comfortable and if they're not, I try to find a way to make them comfortable and that makes them comfortable even if I missed somehow. The intention's important. Um, I think if people know they're in a studio and they're about to make a record, if you need to motivate them, there's something wrong with them. You know, so I, I really like to work with bands where I can tell there's this, you know, innate passion for what they're doing. And if they're just kind of like, eh, I don't like my song, I don't like my voice. It's like, too bad. You're in a band and you're singing. Do it well, like, try everything. So sometimes it's uh, trying to find out what will make somebody do something better. In the case of vocals, for example, you might want to put them in a big room where they feel like they're kind of like, they can push their vocals. Sometimes you put them in the closet, no light, and just let them, it just works better. Case in point would be um, a guitar player singer. They wrote the song probably on guitar. They're used to singing and playing together. You ask them to play the guitar and then to sing separately and it's a physical thing. They're used to doing it that way. Their timing is different. Their inflection is different. Partly it's because they're dedicating a good percentage of their awareness to two tasks simultaneously. If they're just singing, they're gonna be maybe too specific about things. And then the flow would be different. So I've done things where I've had to like redo the, um, well, have the singer sing and strum a guitar where we deadened all the strings so that they're doing it. When it comes to processing channels during tracking, how does he approach things? I, I kind of keep it simple. Um, part of having a lot of good gear is that the amount of time saved getting it right when you're tracking is incredible. And you can kind of tell because then you know, let's say if you're switching between songs, you come back to the song and it's like, oh yeah, this, is, this, yeah, this worked out really well. That's good, you know? If you come back and you're like, I'm still not happy with that, you know? So in that case, I guess you have to kind of get tricky and try to figure out what's missing, what's wrong. 
Um, in the case of bass or drums or vocals where I'm printing them to tape, you figure that's enough. You know, you can like get rid of all your plugins, print to tape with a good EQ on the, on the way back in, and then you're good. Well, often I'll do that and then keep going another round or two of processing, but mostly just to get what I want, not for the sake of it. It's just if there's something, you know, it's it, it's a combination in that sense. Um, in the way I would do parallel is uh, sort of really the old fashioned way. I'd take all the drums, print them to tape on the stereo, pair of tracks, bring it back, phase align it, and then kind of blend back the natural kit. That gets tricky because the tape machine's a bit irregular. So you have to just make sure it's good throughout. Uh, you might find that at some point, oh my God, what's happening now? Things are out of phase. And so you have to kind of go back and nudge things and listen and just do it by ear. It's the best way to do it. I found over the years that the tape machine gives me something for mostly for drums and bass that I find really incredible and to a different extent for guitars and vocals. Um, and organs, two organs sound really good on tape. Just about everything sounds really good on tape. It, a lot of work went into this machine being able to do what it does. It's kind of incredible. You put it in, comes back out, it's sounding pretty much the same, a little different in the sense of what we're used to sonically. For a lot of rock and roll stuff, it's, it's sort of, that's kind of why it sounds the way it does. It's slightly modified. Sorry. For some projects, I'll record uh, <clears throat> basics to tape and then bring it to the computer and then kind of do the rest of the overdubs and vocals. Um, and then for some projects, I'll record, mostly if we're doing, let's say, five, 10, 15 takes of a song, it's kind of hard to do that with tape and you have to keep track of where the take is and maybe have a bunch of rolls available. So in that case, I'll track it to the computer. Once we've decided which take we're doing, I'll see if I think some of the elements should hit tape. Uh, in general, though, they should hit tape as a group. If you have two guitars in a room, it's not really smart to put one to tape and then one not because there'll be, there'll be some issues that show up. I mean, and I'm not saying it's bad, so I'm not condemning that possibility that could go really wrong, but um, in general, I found that it was, uh, it was tricky. So, and once I think it happened that it was great because it was totally warbling and, but it, you know, for like a little segment and I had to redo it to do it right and then used it for the rest of the song, yeah. It's all special effects and it's all no special effects. It's all like the purest lens you can imagine and putting Vaseline on the lens and sprinkling stuff at it so everything's kind of blowing out and looking wild and sounding wild. Um, it really depends what you're looking for. I had a label a few years ago and I'd asked a bunch of bands to come in and uh, do a song, uh, like a new song or a cover, whatever they wanted to do. And we'd work on it together, it'd be really fun. These are bands that I enjoyed working with and I was working with Deer Hunter on one song and they had a few hours before a show and they were leaving town. So we tracked it and it sounded pretty good. They left and then I was sitting there kind of futzing around with stuff. And so for the whole breakdown section, I had recorded it on tape. So for the whole breakdown section, I left it as it was, got rid of the drums, took the tape machine back to the same spot, went to half speed and brought that version in, lined it up. So the whole middle section is a combination of the guitars and the bass and a keyboard at normal speed and the drums are underneath this like weird wallowing boom, boom, boom. and then slowly I crossfade back to the normal version. How does Nicholas go about processing the stereo mix? It's funny for some type of material I find it's really helpful to do that and to kind of be a little aggressive with it and for some material I feel like it just kind of sucks the life out of it and so I'll compress individually but then I kind of want to feel like there's no box around the recording. And with maybe more dance oriented stuff where there's a very um, even, regular, repetitive, hypnotic kind of sound, uh, it's nice if they all kind of mush together. Mm. So the mix bus is fun for that because you can play around with what it's doing to um, What's it doing to the drums? What's it doing to the vocals? What happens when it gets really loud? Do things kind of feel like they're about to break? Or does it just kill it? Which means the loudest part of the song is exactly as loud as the intro with the acoustic guitar and the vocal. Mm -hmm. That doesn't feel very powerful. <laughs> you need to actually, you know, find a way to make it feel like, whoa, this is a big step up in volume. 
Well, sometimes what I'll do is I'll kind of do some extreme compression on once the mix is already done for myself. I won't necessarily let the artist hear that, but I'll kind of go back and when I'm having a little downtime, do a kind of an extreme, very quick compression on it and just see what happens. And then sometimes it sounds better that way. So I just use that. <laughs> but sometimes it doesn't. You know, it's never, there's, I mean, for me, there's not too many hard and fast rules. Nicholas has instrumental credits on many of the albums he's produced. We ask how this process works. I replace everything. <laughs> no, uh, I'd say that if there's something, that, same thing, so if there's something that's needed, and I think I know how to do it, and, I don't, it, and it can be done quickly, then I'll volunteer. Um, but if there's an idea I have, for example, I don't know how to play piano, but if I hear something, that hasn't been put in there, that could be really helpful for a transition, for a section, then it's a conversation with the musician and then they do it. Um, but in a few cases when I've done it, it's usually some goofy instrument like a tambourine or the SK-1 or some manipulation, like a bunch of effects. Like I have fun with the tape machines a lot, like with the ta um, an analog tape echoes. Uh, I play with them a lot. I'll, you know, if there's a pad, I'll get it to be on the verge of feedback and then just kind of play around with the speed so it feels like it's modulating. That's kind of like a performance of sorts, but I don't know what instrument that is. Right. Tape echo. Finally, we asked Nicholas to show us three of his favorite instruments or pieces of gear from Rare Book Room. Uh, this is a Universal Audio 175B, and it's a tube uh, limiter and compressor. It's the ancestor sort of to the 1176, not quite though. Um, what's nice about it is it has a wide um, gain on the input and it can be pushed fairly hard to achieve um, obliterating levels of distortion if needed. The Casio SK-1 is a wonderful piece of gear. It's a small sampler from the 80s. Oh my, it's on. Dangerous. So you just sample something into it. and then you can play it. Or you can use the rhythm. There's that. This is the fun machine. Uh, oh, it's coming on. You hear that? It's coming online. It's got a little rhythm section over here. Secret weapon of the recording studio. It's got a minor bar. So you can modulate that. And we're back. Oh boy. If you enjoyed this feature, why not subscribe to the Sound on Sound YouTube channel for all of our latest videos. Also, there's loads more written content in the magazine, which you can get from your local newsagent, download on your tablet, or read online at soundonsound.com. Thanks for watching.